This conference will now be recorded. Good afternoon and welcome to AI Answers, weekly updates and answers from the world's leading valuation authority. Thank you for joining us today. It is August 26, 2020, and I am Bill Garber, Director of Government and External Relations for the Appraisal Institute. We are going to talk about a real estate and economic development concept called adaptive reuse, which is becoming an all too common question and opportunity in the real estate sector, thanks in part to COVID-19. And we're gonna draw some ex from uh, some experts in the real estate and economic development space to talk about adaptive reuse and what that looks like going ahead in commercial real estate. And first, let me just tee it up a little bit. Adaptive reuse, of what is it exactly? And from Wikipedia, adaptive reuse refers to the process of reusing an existing building for a purpose other than which it was originally designed for. It's also known as recycling or conversion, which are uh, common concepts in real estate, of course. And what got us into this today? Um, frankly, my social media feed and some of our um, past experience, I happened to look at my LinkedIn scroll recently and saw this interesting post from a real estate broker, uh, Rob Andrew Shaw, DCIM, and with a comment from Casey Conway, MAI, and Chief Economist for the CCIM Institute, talking about a proposed project or a sketched project involving a big box retail store or and space and a conversion using Motel 6. And got to thinking about this a little bit more and reflecting on some of my past work, um, previous life, in the economic development sector and reached out to the International Economic Development Council, who I'd previously worked for and I'm very familiar with, and I'm very pleased that they were able to provide some of their expertise um, to contribute with this program today. So with us today are Rob Hunden, President and CEO of Hunden Strategic Partners in Chicago, Illinois, John Kilpatrick, PhD, MAI, Managing Director of Greenfield Advisors in Seattle, Washington. Al Lernus, MAI with Appraisal Services Inc. in Fargo, North Dakota. Bob Lewis, FAICP and CECD, Independent Consultant in Urban Planning and Economic Development in St. Louis, Missouri. Rob and Bob uh, are both involved in the International Economic Development Council and uh, have a common affiliation with their CEO, Jeffrey Finkel, who I give a big thanks to for helping with today's program. So let's go ahead and jump in a little bit to the issue here today, adaptive reuse, what's involved, who's involved, what are some of the dynamics um, from our expert panel? Can you kind of walk us through a little bit? What kind of adaptive reuse projects have you been involved with in the past? And I'm not gonna go in any particular order, just to go ahead and jump in. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll jump in on a couple of, of items. Um, I uh, I guess the biggest thing that um, I work on are um, environmentally impaired properties, uh, brownfields, if you will, as well as, and this is at the opposite end of the spectrum, historic uh, properties, properties in need of historic preservation, historic um, uh, tax credit type projects. Uh, that latter area has gotten a lot of attention for adaptive reuse. We see a lot of old uh, historic homes which have been adaptively reused as uh, anything from bed and breakfast to restaurants to office buildings, um, uh, chopped up into apartments. Uh, uh, this is particularly um, useful east of the Mississippi where you've got the bulk of the, the historic properties. In downtown America, we have a lot of second generation industrial sites which are being adaptively reused. I saw some in Grand Rapids, Michigan recently, which uh, some, some old uh, warehouses, a whole warehouse district in fact, which was no longer useful, but uh, had been converted 
uh, into retail on the ground floor and condos uh, in the floors above those. So there, there are a number of, of different ways in which uh, an old building, either one which uh, may have some environmental problems or some which are worthy of historic preservation, might be adapted to any kind of use you can imagine. Yeah, I'll I'll jump on to that. Um, that's that's so true. Um, Bob and I, um, in, in our respective hometowns, Indianapolis and St. Louis, but so many others, have seen their old Union Station uh, train depots uh, be converted back in the 80s into uh, malls, retail entertainment uh, spaces. Uh, certainly, we saw um, the, the one in Washington D.C. get turned into the Trump Hotel. Um, we and, and as a matter of fact, in in uh, Indianapolis, the train cars converted into a Holiday Inn Express. So we see a lot of adaptive reuse of of older, more difficult properties into hospitality and entertainment spaces. We've also seen um, as as long as uh, ten, twelve, eh, maybe eight, ten years ago. Um, out in Spearfish, South Dakota, but in many other places, you know, the whole conversion of uh, failed big boxes or maybe a, a Walmart gets built uh, down the road and they closed down the first one that was in town. Uh, we saw that with Circuit Cities and so many uh, in the last downturn, but in Spearfish, they, they converted one into a whole community aquatics and rec center. And we, we've seen that um, happen time and again, because these are great big open spaces that um, are already built, and so they're converting to sports and aquatics uses and recreational uses all over the place. So um, cer certainly that, um, and the Motel 6 is, is another uh, great example um, where they're trying to roll that out too. So I've um, got more up my sleeve, but I don't want to monopolize the time. I can throw into the mix. I've been involved with a lot of things like Rob has, but also with... Uh, adaptive reuse of old industrial properties, even for industry. Um, many of these old places were steel plants or chemical plants. Um, they may be brownfields as well, but as long as you use them, reuse them for another industry, they, they have less uh, cleaning requirements. Um, and, but they're already, uh, they, were, you know, they were built for single purposes, Monsanto company or somebody like that, but now they're adapting elsewhere. Cities like to see them rebuilt, adapted because you really don't have to clean them up as much if they are reused by another industry that can deal with that. Uh, they're also already sort of isolated or semi-isolated places uh, away from a lot of residential or a lot of the residential will disappear because of that. And they're suitable for a lot of other uses that may be multi-tenant industrial purposes, uh, both the warehousing distribution kinds as well as specific manufacturing. So a lot of those opportunities I've been involved with as well. Um, and they're kind of exciting because they, 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 they eliminate a potential blight on, in, a, in a city or a wide open space that really needs a lot of serious cleanup. And, and they put people back on the tax rolls. <clears throat> yeah. I used to teach at the University of South Carolina and um, uh, to the south of the campus was uh, something of an industrial area which had fallen into um, disuse. Um, uh, the two cotton mills had, had um, fallen uh, by the wayside and uh, the train station was no longer used. Uh, the university really coveted that area uh, and one of the, the last tenants in that area, South Carolina Electric and Gas, decided to move out of their headquarters. That became something of a, uh, a genesis for the area because that building really had some great bones to it which were useful for engineering research and engineering testing. Mm -hmm. So the, the uh, College of Engineering built a new building across the street and then took that building and made it into their, their uh, lab building. That stimulated the redevelopment of, of two textile mills as um, let's say student oriented housing, not owned by the university, but apartments uh, that were rented largely to students. And then finally the old train station was converted to a California dreaming bar and restaurant, which uh, that, that's been there for 36 years now. And um, I can tell you, they got a great Bloody Mary. I'm looking forward to going back sometime soon. <laughs> Bill, yeah, I'm that... gonna, Bill, I'm going to add a few examples from a smaller metro area. The Fargo-Morad area is about 250,000 people, and we don't have the 
old buildings that a lot of the larger metros that have been discussed have, but several examples in our market are, number one, a recent uh, relocation of a Best Buy store back into a Sears vacated retail store, and the former Best Buy store has now been converted to a multi-tenant building, including a swim aquatic center and a couple of uh, adjacent retailers. And then another more interesting example, perhaps, is a former creamery in Moorhead that was converted a number of years ago through historic credits to a uh, nursing home senior care facility. Uh, there's uh, you know wide varieties of adaptive reuses for these buildings as long as the bone structure is is solid. We just had a recent uh, former furniture warehouse and potato warehouse converted uh, to rental apartments that is going to it's just in the in the stage now of, of opening. So it's it's a phenomenon that takes place whether you're in a big metro or a smaller metro. Yeah, I could see that. I mean, to some extent, it's like somebody's imagination and creativity that, that is involved in this. But what are some common questions that might be asked by the property owner or the prospective developer in a, an adaptive use situation? Well, one key question is always, what's the quality and the status of the utilities? Um, again, I'm sort of harping on the uh, or dealing with the industrial side, but um, one of the advantages of adaptive reuse in any area, and certainly with industry, is there's already a lot of infrastructure there. The right kinds of water, sewer, pipelines, uh, electricity uh, at some scale, and so forth. So it, it makes it easier, probably less expensive to uh, to reinstall that stuff. But it also is very important to ask the question: What's the quality of the that infrastructure? Uh, the, the pipelines uh, the, may be there, but maybe the pipes need to be replaced. Or the wires may need to be replaced, but you've got a lot of it already. So one of the key questions I think, Bill, uh, to start with is certainly is what's the, uh, the, the quality of that infrastructure and uh, does it need any upgrading or even downgrading? But, uh, but it's already there, so it saves a lot of money. Um, our friends over at CCIM Institute uh, published a white paper uh, on this topic last year in conjunction with the Alabama Real Estate um, uh, Center. And um, they estimate that about 1% to 2% of CBD real estate is actively in adaptive reuse right now. They expect in very short order that's going to grow to about 4%. Now that may not sound like much, but they liken it to the wave of historic preservation that occurred in the late 70s, early 80s, and think it could be that big a, a, a deal. Uh, as a result, they're encouraging uh, their CCIM members and uh, their contacts in the development industry to, to really uh, begin asking these questions, begin developing a taxonomy of questions to be asked, uh, because they, they, uh, they see uh, this uh, as uh, a really a new growth area for their commercial members. John, I'm going to add uh, as a plug for the CCIM. I, I got my MEI in the early 80s, and I got a CCIM in the mid-1990s, and it was an excellent education and a wonderful opportunity to cross-reference uh, or, or interact with different disciplines in the same industry. And I would highly encourage our listeners today to explore that option. I believe if you're a designated appraisal institute member, they fast track you to a CCIM designation and it's some excellent education. I've, I've looked into that, but they still want me to write a check, doggone it. <laughs> Gotta do that. It's it's worth it. Let me, I'll tell you personally, I believe it's worth it. My wife and my CPA have locked away my checkbook. <laughs> So you all are consultants, property consultants, essentially. Uh, in this situation, who, who's the most common common client uh, for your work, and what does that scope of work involve? We, we've had uh, really 
both public and private sector, I, I would say our, our, our practice and Bob's uh, practice um, is primarily public sector with some probably 20% private sector is, is, you know, plus or minus. And uh, so, yeah, it's oftentimes that the public sector is either looking to figure out what the heck do we do with this old thing? Um, how can we, you know, turn a, turn a lemon into lemonade? Or they've been approached by somebody with a whiz bang <clears throat> idea to turn something into something really cool. And a lot of times we're tasked with assessing, does this make any sense? Because it's always really cool, but half the time uh, or more, uh, the, the idea is nonsensical and not viable, and, and, but they've gotten the attention of the mayor or the city manager or something like that. And so that we have to go and assess it and often break bad news to them that, boy, that would be a cool reuse, but a, the historians uh, would, would go nuts, or uh, even if you got historical tax credits, um, it, it's still not going to pencil. So, you know, the, the, we often find ourselves in those situations, but where there is a, a situation where there's, say, just an old office building that's convertible into a, a new hotel, you know, that doesn't take a huge imagination to, to, uh, to see it through. And so we we work with both public and, and private sector clients. We just did one in Sioux City, Iowa, um, the um, Badger built that'll be converted from an old, beautiful old um, Art Deco office building into a mixed use residential and retail space in their downtown. So just, that's just one of many examples. Bill, over the years, uh, we found a lot of the clients uh, as, uh, our young developers. Uh, developers like to build things. That's what they, their blood is to do those things. But when they're uh, getting started or spinning off from uh, another development company creating their own, uh, you know, they're a little, uh, it's hard to get into the market, hard to break through. Um, but the big developers or uh, those who have been around, well, they, they aren't really into the old stuff or adaptive reuse. So there's a niche there for a lot of uh, up and coming kinds of developers where they can get in and Buy something a little, uh, push that envelope a little bit, maybe have to work harder at it to get the, the mayor and the city council and the economic development office, let alone the banks, to agree what's what's going on. But they're hardworking and therefore make the risk a little bit less. Uh, and it gives them a, a, step, a step up. Some of them stay in that industry. A lot of the industry people we've worked with go back to other old industry, uh, manufacturing buildings and tear down some and upgrade others for, for, for new occupants, new users. But that's a, a, a key client niche. Um, folks who are looking for that niche to get into the market, learn the trade, start making some money that they can uh, reinvest and uh, and grow and compete. <clears throat> I was speaking at a big Brownfields conference in Denver a few years ago, and there was a, um, a poster session, a uh, big room full of uh, folding tables and cardboard charts and maps of, of, of various towns and cities around the United States who had downtown brownfield redevelopment opportunities, probably 50 of them in this big room. And I went around and spoke with a lot of these, these um, city urban planners and, and such and so forth. Uh, and it was, it was sad. And, and the reason it was sad was so many of them have no understanding of what real estate development is all about, issues like supply, demand, how real estate finance works, um, the concept of doing a market study. They had a dirty priest property and they wanted a developer to come in and write a check and redevelop it. Um, I say all of that to say this, those of us who are either in the, the development side, the consulting side, the appraising side, the CCIM folks, um, have to be in the education business. Uh, at, at the end of the day, the, the local city or county government is going to be the nexus of interest in this. And, and we're going to have to spend a lot of time educating them on exactly how this works, why there are no pies in the sky, uh, why there's no magic money, uh, and, and exactly what might be financially feasible to do or not do. Yeah. Is it... Um... A, just a question of highest and best use? You know, um, that's part of it. And I was making some notes as I was, I was thinking about this, this issue. 
from an appraiser's perspective, um, uh, some of the things that, that real estate appraisers are going to need to brush up on and therefore some of the things that they're, they're going to need to converse with cities about uh, are, are, are really valuation fundamentals. How to do market study, what goes into a market study, how that market study feeds that highest and best use, what, what financial feasibility actually means, um, and the fact that profit is not a dirty word. Um, that cap rates for adaptive reuse properties are going to be very, very different from cap rates for brand new properties or existing um, uh, sustained properties. Um, we all know in the development business, if I go out and develop a, a, buy a piece of land, develop an apartment complex, get it up to sustained, stabilized occupancy and sell it, I've got a myriad of cap rates. One cap rate at the land, one at the development phase, and then one that I sell it to a, a REIT when I finally get it up to sustain occupancy. Throw in a very different factor for the fact that the money is coming from a different place. This is not your standard Bank of America loan. Uh, the, the investment side, the equity is going to be very different. The loan to value ratio is going to be very different. And as a result, you know, the cap rate that we have to discount the stuff with is going to be very different. You're always going to have some functional disutility in these properties. You're often going to have some some super amenities in these properties. Um, you take an industrial site, redevelop it as an apartment complex, and you're probably going to have twice as much parking as you need. That's a super amenity. How do you value it? Or, or, or do you now have excess land that you can sell off? So these are questions that an appraiser needs to be able to help answer. And, and these are issues that are going to have to be discussed in, in short sentences with simple words to the people down at City Hall. And I think uh, part, of the, part of the issue becomes helping your prospective client understand the right questions to ask. Mm -hmm. As John was mentioning, uh, and oftentimes an appraiser thinks they can answer the question in an appraisal context and it re you've really got to look at it from the standpoint of your client and what is their real question and how can you help them get meaningful answers and I find a lot of times it involves what I call a series of what if analysis where you make a certain set of assumptions about what might work and you play with that to see if it's a viable option or not. And some of that can be how much money is the city willing to provide or how much wiggle room is there in their zoning classifications for increasing density or reducing parking. So you get into a whole series of what ifs to help them figure out what it is they're trying to accomplish. And then you design a scope of work that can address those questions in within the context of what an appraiser does, and I don't necessarily think USPAP helps, but it doesn't be it it isn't a hindrance if you know how to structure your work product and ask the right questions to to frame the scope of work in a meaningful way. Now I spend the bulk of my time teaching math to lawyers, um, <laughs> and and the way you do that, by the way, is you use short sentences and bill by the hour, but <laughs> We've happened on a phrase at my firm, which is explain it to me like I'm a fifth grader. And 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 when when our folks at Greenfield come to me with, with issues, problems, details, research, I really want them to explain it to me like I'm a fifth grader, because then I'm going to have to go out and explain that to other people, oftentimes like they are a fifth grader. Um, and I had a judge once tell me, if you've dumbed it down this far to explain it to lawyers, you got to dumb it down more to explain it to the court. Um, <laughs> and, and, and I would put that there's a notch below the screen if we're going to get down to City Hall and have that very slow, methodical conversation about what this thing's going to look like at the end of the day. Rob and Bob, do you see it the same? Well, I guess I would say from my perspective, so a lot of times when we're looking at uh, ground up facilities, 
we generally know what things are going to cost on a per square foot basis and and we know that they're going to be designed at the state of the art with the right column spacing or no columns or whatever the situation is going to be and i think that's the the harder and bigger unknown when we're doing a feasibility study in an adaptive reuse is what are all the sort of in, infrastructure things in the building that need to change um, or or the money pit that you open up when you start uh, pulling things apart. And so we often like to have, um, you know, certainly design and, and engineering or construction folks sort of in the wings when we're doing our studies, because there's just, there's got to be a huge contingency factor for, yeah, there may be a market for this conversion opportunity, but the cost side is such a huge unknown. Um, you know, the example in downtown Indianapolis that we're uh, trying to convert a you know 100 plus year old office building into a really hip cool hotel um our, our delta is is 15 million from when the developer bought it to today in terms of the build out so um you know and the, the the value of the historic tax credits is maybe six so um i think that's the most difficult part when you're on our side of this trying to assess something conceptually when there's just real nuts and bolts physically that you got to sort of grind through that are real unknown. So I would just say double or triple your contingencies. Yeah, that, I fully agree with that. You start moving pipes around, taking walls down, see what's really there. You're going to find what even the engineers couldn't have predicted. Uh, and that, that adds to cost, it adds to risk, uh, but there are changes that have to be made. Um, I would say also, uh, but the, all the conditions we're talking about, certainly what Rob just talked about, is a good excuse to hit City Hall for uh, a lot of incentive monies or incentive programs. Uh, they don't want these properties to end up being blights or vacant. Uh, they want them active um, and so forth. So, you, uh, so where you've got those kinds of extraordinary costs, uh, both known and, and anticipated, it may be a really good way to, to qualify for some fairly substantial incentive kinds of dollars or programs uh, so that they, the city becomes a partner in the deal in effect, or the public sector does. Um, they've got a vested interest in that property. It sits in their city. So um, uh, taking all that information, but don't, yeah, don't go in there just with the market analyst or the appraisal, appraiser. <coughs> There's a lot more. Yeah, that might be a great idea for a motel or a, or, or an apartment building that we're con converting from an old industrial loft building. Uh, has anybody opened it up and found out what the electricity is like? And Lord knows, I heck can't do that. <laughs> Bring well, the engineer. I mean, it speaks to one of the thoughts that I had was, you know, if you're, no matter what perspective you're coming from, if it's the consultant side, property consultant, appraiser, broker side, if you're entering this space, what what kind of relationships do you need to forge? It sounds like you've kind of you kind of have to work several different angles between the development, the finance, and the public sector in trying to to be involved in this process. Yeah, I fully agree with that. Um, and I think it's critical in such uh, situations that you early on, as one example, I'll start in that direction, to have the public sector with you, have the the industrial authority people or the economic development office, certainly, but uh, those who are providing or overseeing the incentive programs probably know the territory, they know the financing, know things are going on. Have them there as well. Uh, we got a great idea, but you're probably going to be called upon to be a partner in this deal in some manner, dear development authority uh, of the county or the city. So um, I like to encourage them to be part of that of that team in a sense, not really a paid member of a consulting team, but have them there so that they can offer um, insights along the way about how well this will sell in City Hall uh, to qualify for, or even further up the line with the EDA or the State Economic Development Authorities, will the money qualify and how do we set it up so they can do that? So one of those partners, uh, Bill, is really bring in the public sector. And, and, and by the way, they'll be a lot friendlier about it rather than coming to them in, at a very late hour and saying, we need $15 million. What? We didn't know anything about that. Um, but now they not only know about it, they know why and have a pretty good feel for it. 
But in that situation, are and you're acting as a consultant, are you acting as a, an, a representative of the developer, or has, and is it more common for the public sector agencies to seek out those services uh, in partnership with the private sector? Or what, what's the what's the um, the range of of um, clientele? I guess it's probably all the above in some ways. I think Robert pointed out earlier that. A lot of his clients, mine at the, in the time, were are, are, is the public sector. They're looking for highest and best uses, if you will, uh, of of old uh, abandoned properties or properties that have lost a lot of their uh, functional value. So, uh, can we put an RFP together uh, to attract a developer, and what's that going to take, and for what kind of uses would be most appropriate? So, you've got that that angle as well as, uh, and uh, and in that case, he or I would be representing. Uh, the interest of the public sector, but we also know the private sector and their needs uh, for profit. Uh, so it's in, in the end, uh, we know that very well. So let's structure the RFP or whatever is going to, the, the agreements anyway, toward making sure if you, the city, want this to succeed as a private development, um, we've got to structure it in such a way that the dollars will come in and return the right level of investment for the uh, on the equity. <clears throat> What do you? What would you say are the biggest challenges then when you are presented with a a uh, feasibility request or question uh, relating to adaptive reuse? Is it is it a cost issue or a financing issue or an environmental issue? What what are some of the the most common impediments? Yeah, I think it's all of the above. I mean, we we just looked at an at an old. Um, manufacturing and warehousing building in Sterling, Illinois, it's massive. And, you know, it's a small community and a huge building. So it's, it was a question of what kind of uses could fit. Um, it, uh, certainly anything could fit um, in the massive space, but the spaces weren't always configured properly and they can't be modified very easily. Uh, so it was a question of, well, how do you, how do you start to sort of, um, cut this up a little bit so that you so that it's usable so all the things you talked about which is physical impediments environmental impediments sort of the character of the space um you know what's conducive for certain kinds of uses i mean they're just they're just a lot of things that can be really really cool when you're talking about a historic structure but um it it really does take uh, a, a comprehensive approach usually involving the public sector to sort of see it through in a way that makes sense because you could you could completely whiff with a great idea. And even the best ideas that have had a lot of help and been well executed have failed over time. I mean, the, the Union Station examples that that I mentioned, they lasted about 10, 15 years apiece and before they sort of petered out. Um, so, you know, there's a time and a place for everything. And uh, it, it just, there's a lot of, you know, um hurdles and 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 pitfalls i would say looking at comps and interviewing your peers and comps around the country who have pulled it off and succeeded for three to five plus years call them and find out how the heck did you pull this off because we know that we, we call it ops chops you can have a great idea but if you don't you can't ex execute your to your toast <laughs> mm -hmm. Any additional thoughts, sir? I might add, by the way, that Rob probably knows this Union Station in St. Louis worked greatly, and then it fell apart again, but it's now working greatly again under a new developer. Uh, still an entertainment center, we got a big Ferris wheel, all that stuff. So it, they, there are cycles, there are lifespans to these things. The market uh, so changed. It's on its third use, really as a railroad station and then an entertainment complex and now it's second round on an entertainment complex complex but it's you know of course even the second time around it just opened you know last summer um it's uh you know hundreds of millions of dollars the developers have to recover that fairly quickly to make it worth their while you'd love it to last for 60 years but they may need to make their money back in 15. <clears throat> You know, I mentioned um, a lot of historic uh, conversions going on east of the Mississippi, but I'm headquartered here in, in Seattle. And uh, Seattle, which is 
certainly a younger city than say Charleston, South Carolina, nonetheless has a lot of buildings downtown which are uh, crying out for adaptive reuse. So uh, we've seen um, quite a few, uh, not just historic buildings, but simply buildings that uh, uh, no longer fulfill the purpose for which they were originally designed, um, being reused. Um, here in Seattle, building a new building can take a long time. The permitting process, the entitlement process, uh, and, and as we all know, time is money. But if we've got an existing structure which can be adaptively reused, A, we're going to get some buy-in from the city. B, we're able to cut that, that permitting time really extensively. Um, sometimes our, our, our legal costs and permitting costs are going to be much lower. And so um, even though we may have some functional disutility, even though we may end up with a building that's not quite as valuable as, as a new building might be, um, even though we might have some contingency problems, we are saving a bunch of time, energy, and money on the front end um, mm -hmm. by trying to do that adaptive reuse. Right, yeah. So we've all been living with COVID the last several months. What What's your take on how COVID is going to affect this issue in retail or in other sectors? Wow. <laughs> Well, that jury's out. <laughs> uh, yeah, there yeah. is a huge building um, about a mile from where I'm sitting right now, which was uh, a grocery store. Then it became an uh, office supply store, office max type of facility. Then it became a lazy boy furniture store. Now, those kinds of migrations through retail aren't much. But for the last six months, it's been locked shut. Nobody's buying Lazy Boy recliners right now. Um, even when this thing cranks back up, uh, my suspicion is that we're going to be slow to come out of this recession in no small part because a lot of people have drained their savings um, and um, they're, they're going to be catching up on necessities, uh, such and so forth. So um, um, I suspect we're, go we're going to see a real change in demand for some kinds of real estate, retail in in particular. Uh, that's that's going to be a hard sell for the next couple of years. And I I don't know what this exactly means, but if if we're going to see some demand for HVAC professionals, because <clears throat> we've got to re rework our uh, ventilation systems, frankly, probably. I mean, I don't know how they modern ones work and all that, but clearly we're learning that we got to move air through in different ways, different speeds and so forth, whatever all that means, uh, filtering it differently and so forth. So there could be a, you know, a, a rise in demand for those, uh, that kind of skilled craftsmen and, and as well as the engineers that plan all that stuff um, for, and that would be for, you know, obviously for new buildings, but certainly for retrograde, uh, retrofitting. Yeah. We're doing this meeting on, on go to meeting. Um, there's also Zoom, there's uh, Cisco's WebEx. Uh, I've used all three of them recently. We all know that Zoom went down yesterday, um, overuse, because so many of the schools and universities are depending on it. Uh, I mentioned earlier that I taught a, a class at Washington State University last semester. I don't know if I said that on camera or not. Uh, we used uh, WebEx for that. That technology infrastructure and the amount of bandwidth which is devoted to these kinds of video conferences is going to get bigger rather than smaller. I mean, this is a wave of the present. Uh, mm -hmm. And so there's going to be a real demand for um, infrastructure, uh, infrastructure, real estate investment trusts, um, technology centers, everything to support uh, the fact that we're not using a physical conference room right now. And the fact that I'm here having a very important business meeting barefooted. Oh, well, that makes two of us, John. Uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> but, but think about the implications for what John just mentioned for these full service hotels that have a significant component of their business being meeting room spaces that provide uh, food and beverage services to those attendees and then lodging for the people that used to come there. 
uh, that that component of their business is gone if if this future is electronic meetings like this. So there'll be massive reconfigurations of those old full service hotels to some other use. Uh, and, and the same applies to uh, denser housing. As uh, Bob mentioned, the, the HVAC requirements, but also the vertical transportation, the common areas where you assemble to get into your elevators to get to your units, there's going to be rethinking done there on how you separate and isolate people. And I mean, it's just a, it's a massive rethinking of how people can maintain their security of themselves and still live in a more dense environment than we're used to in the past. If even in the non-full service hotels, uh, Courtyard Marriott, Hilton Garden Inn, for example, if people are going to start demanding a higher level of sanitation and cleaning in the rooms before they check in, and I know a lot of people are doing that, um, mm -hmm. and some chains have been stepping up to the plate on that, the the cost of operation in those hotels, the, the, the cost of housekeeping services, management services, all of those things are, are going to be significantly higher uh, than they are right now. And you're right about the, the, the conference hotels. One uh, one manager at a Four Seasons once told me that uh, renting rooms was just ancillary to the money they made holding conferences, luncheons, banquets, and such and so forth. Um, if they're not doing that anymore, you know, there are a lot of hotels that don't <laughs> pencil out anymore. Yeah, we, we do a lot of hotel work and we're, we do a lot of hotel advisory on investments uh, to the private sector and we're looking at a lot of distressed hotels and you know we, one of our factors now that we're looking at is the duration of the lockdown because the longer the lockdowns have occurred the more strangled the hotels have become um, in many cases they're being um, sort of uh, leaked out for homeless shelters and other shelters and that has not been certainly good for the assets. Um, I mean, it's good for the owner for a minute, um, but as a conversion use in San Francisco, they've become horrendously dangerous places to be in general and unhealthy. Um, in New York, it's the same situation. So um, I would say those are um, adaptive reuses that we wouldn't necessarily recommend. Um, it, 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 it pays the bills for a minute because you're using FEMA money uh, to do that, but um, the condition, I mean, they're going to have to go through a complete gut renovation when they're done, um, it, it, depending on the population that's being housed in, in these properties. But yeah, in, in other places where hotels are operating, uh, they're not allowed to have more than 50 people in a gathering. Um, we've done some analysis here in Chicago, and it's it's been a, a devastating blow. And, and meanwhile, you know, casinos, other places, you, you have way more than 50 people getting together. So there's some, there, there's been an unheaven hand dealt to a lot of uh, real estate, uh, which is making it all pretty distressed in a lot of places, especially urban centers. Speaking of adaptive reuse, um, in Manhattan, um, you know, there's plenty of adaptive reuse of buildings. One that comes to mind was a, a bank office, which was on one of the streets near Macy's, uh, just to the east side of Herald Square. Um, and the building was quite large. Uh, the owner decided to repurpose it as uh, limited service hotels. And rather than build one, he chopped the building into three. So he had a Courtyard Marriott, uh, a Hilton Garden Inn, and, and something with a Hyatt flag uh, with three different doors spanning half a half city block all essentially in the same building those i haven't been back to manhattan since all this this collapsed but i i gotta wonder how all of those hotels in manhattan are doing right now yeah right mm -hmm. yeah there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty in the market right now no question about that uh and it's it is probably too early to say what to do exactly with some of these some of these projects, some of these buildings. For the professional service providers out there who are interested in, in this issue, what kind of skill sets do, would you recommend they, they beef up on and um, explore? 
United States. Great question. For the appraisers, I would say beef up on the cost approach. A lot of appraisers, particularly those who do not, who who, who mostly do transactional or financing work, are are um, really don't have a strong skill set in the cost approach. They've they've got to um, utilize that to get a fulsome understanding of functional and and physical disutility. Um, the, how that's going to transition as this building is adaptively reused. They're going to have to beef up their skill sets on market studies, highest to best use studies. And I mentioned earlier, really uh, understand the bones of a cap rate, how one develops appropriate discount and cap rates to be able to financially analyze these, these projects. Mm -hmm. John, speaking to that uh, point, I uh, had my eyes opened recently. I was asked by a, a hotel owner that was struggling because their occupancy was down and they were trying to determine if their facility was adaptable to a low income rental housing, uh, like a rental apartment conversion. Yeah. And I talked to a couple of hotel people that I knew that had worked on these kinds of things. And they told me that it probably depends on the brand and the design standards that was used for the original hotel. These are limited service, you know, l l hotels, but some of the, the, the spacings of the rooms and the utility connections, a couple of the different brands worked very well. There was enough space that could be done relatively inexpensively. But some of the other brands had different design standards and the units were either too small or too big to convert and the plumbing was in the wrong walls and it got very expensive. So it was prohibitive. So your point about understanding the cost approach, but also understanding construction methodologies, methodologies and design standards is really important when you're looking at these alternative uses. There is a Marriott Hotel across the street from Towson State University in Towson, Maryland. It was originally designed to be an assisted living facility. That failed. Then they converted it to student housing. And then they reflagged the whole thing, emptied the students out and reflagged it as a Marriott Hotel, which is it's if you go in it, the layout is very, very strange for a Marriott Hotel, but go with it for a second. I was talking to one of the two heads of maintenance for Marriott for North America, pretty high up in the rankings. And we were talking about various hotels. And he said that that one facility was the biggest maintenance nightmare in the entire Marriott chain. Uh, so th this kind of adaptive reuse, conversion, 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 uh, sometimes can make some economic sense sometimes can save a facility, but may create long-term cost problems, expense problems that were unforeseen in the beginning. Which means we need interesting tra uh, training with craftsmen for making those repairs or the, you know, the work, or even the custodians <clears throat> that look at it every day, uh, not only cleaning it, but minor repairs and it's, it's not the same as with a new, new building. That's an interesting point, John. Sure. I know in, uh, when I first moved to St. Louis 40 odd years ago, uh, some of this adaptive reuse in neighborhoods was starting with young people, but they couldn't find any uh, skilled people, skilled craftsmen that knew how to rehab old buildings, <clears throat> even old houses. Uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff you did sweat equity. Your dad knew how to do it, but the industry wasn't geared that way. Uh, over the years, that rapidly changed. Uh, the in, the the, the capabilities of the home builders changed, um, the uh, the contractors, the the, uh, the skilled craftsmen and so forth. So we may have, from a professional services point of view, Bill, we may be seeing uh, a lot of that element of things, the people who actually build or change stuff, um, uh, learning new skills and new, learning new techniques, maybe even learning uh, in the manufacturing world, new uh, materials and ways to, uh, to put things back together or make them so that they're a minimum of, of, of future maintenance problems, as John, John just pointed out. They were, they were doing work. Adapt those things. So that's a good thing. 
they were they were doing some work on the Episcopal Cathedral in Manhattan. And they found out they had to set up a school to train stonemasons to be able to to to, to make uh, gargoyles and grotesques for the building. Right. And we had a challenge like that around here years ago with uh, just with tuck pointers. You know, nobody was doing that. Everything was new in the old days, and the old stuff just fell apart. But yeah. all of a sudden, we need tuck pointers, and and they uh, some of them now, man, they do a job that just knock your socks off. Mm -hmm. Finally. Um, for networking, business development, are there any organizations that you'd recommend that people reach out to and, and get involved with? Well, I'm a big fan of the uh, Urban Land Institute as kind of a catch-all for lots of these professions. Uh, IEDC certainly, or the American Planning Association I'm involved with are, are also that way, And but I think the ULI is Kind of a place where everybody shows up um and by the way i would throw in there given my last remarks and some others um the american institute of architects and the related professions along those lines because there's a lot of i think a lot of architectural skills are going to have to be ad adapted grown changed and be creative about them uh, now once you get into the the crafts unions and so forth i don't know what that relationship would be but it probably ought to be there <clears throat> Yeah, I would concur with that. Um, uh, a, a great adapter we used that we, at least a study we participate in was uh, for a technical advisory panel for ULI, a TAP, um, in the, at the Joliet prison, the old historical prison that's been used for a lot of great TV shows and movies. Uh, but they wanted to know, hey, what could we do with this thing? And, and a soccer pitch, a rugby pitch, uh, you know, all kinds of different retail entertainment, all kinds of things. So ULI is always thinking uh, creatively um, because they have to. It's that's urban land. It's always being reinvented for some new use. So um, I, I would second what uh, Bob said, IEDC for sure. Um, and uh, I, I would stick with those two. Well, one of the, uh, you raise the, the technical advisory panels, Rob, one of the advantages of them is they involve eight or nine people from different professions involved with the Urban Land Institute. So solving these problems, uh, Bill, is going to take uh, teamwork. You're going to need the, the appraisers, the market analysts, you're going to need the urban planners, you're going to need the architects and the landscape architects. You're going to probably need, now occasionally you're going to need a contractor to, uh, and, and, or, or a, a skilled crafts craftsman uh, to solve, uh, to address some of these things all on a team. So the, the TAP program, just to drill down on that, who, who's orchestrating that? Is that being done in conjunction with a public public entity? Yeah, often it is. At, uh, Urban Land Institute, um, uh, it's sort of a collaboration typically of a sponsor entity or a, or a member organization. Uh, so it could be a city, it could be um, any public or, or, or related nonprofit or authority that's um, basically, it's almost like a, a, a grant type thing, but I mean, nobody really gets paid to do it, but it's sort of, it's a great volunteer opportunity for members um, to come together and sort of use their ideas. And it's, and it's an intensive, it's, it's, it's sort of like if you did a school project in, in 48 hours, they get everybody together for two industrious days of brainstorming by you know people who have been around the block a time or two like those of us here and, and many others in real estate to just brainstorm the heck out of what what could be done with this piece of land or this old building and then it's written up into a plan um and and it's um it's just super intensive it's very fun and then the the findings are presented it's uh and because it's done so quickly uh, the final result takes a while for someone to transcribe and all that, but but uh, there's a presentation that literally happens at the end of day two, and it really can get the ball rolling and excitement in a community going to say like, hey, we had all these professionals come together and just give us their whiz bang ideas, but we also had the financial folks there, like those of us on the panel, saying, but but but, and so at the end of it, we came out with something was not only cool but probably viable. So. Uh, those are neat processes to uh, participate in. Yeah, no, that sounds very interesting. Lock the door and don't come out until you figure it out the problem. That's kind of what it is. Exactly. <laughs> I don't remember the Urban Land Institute, but I spent a lot of time in New Orleans after Katrina. 
Mm -hmm. um, and um, there was certainly in Katrina a rescue phase, a, a rehabilitation phase, and then a repositioning phase um, mm -hmm. after Katrina. The ULI came in um, at that that repositioning phase and uh, spent a lot of time down there having those kinds of brainstorming sessions about how do we how do we help reposition New Orleans uh, following the the real economic dislocations uh, that have occurred here. They did a lot of good and a lot of projects came out of that. A lot of, a lot of developers uh, kibbutzed with them, paid attention, listened, made notes, and um, uh, a lot of projects were spawned from that. Bill, I might uh, tag on that a little bit, uh, partly because IEDC has helped put this on and Robert and I both. IEDC and APA also have similar programs to what ULI does at a at a national and even a local level. Uh, they're not quite as sophisticated yet. Uh, we're still getting there. But I know IEDC certainly was active also after Katrina in, in putting economic developers down there to help out with, uh, as volunteers, expenses paid kind of thing. But uh, it helps as well. So when you get these crises situation, we may start treating COVID-19 as a, at least for a while, as a crisis. Um, it's, it's a great solution to put these teams together. People who want to help have been around the block more than one time and uh, and can come up with really viable solutions. They, they take some while to work out the details, but most of us professionals know what will work uh, after years of experience and just then we can work out the details later. So a lot of organizations can do that or they'll team up with the Urban Land Institute and, and as well. So a lot of opportunities there for the professionals. Great thoughts, guys. Bill, and Al, Al, you dropped off a video, but I think you're still on on our audio. No, I, I can still hear the audio, but I lost my video feed. But I would second, obviously, the ULI concept. But individual real estate types, I'm mean, example being BOMA, building owners and managers, mostly office oriented. They have a similar program to assist in complicated analysis of certain developments or renovations. So networking with the BOMA folks or in, uh, for industrial properties, the National Association of Industrial and Office Parks, NAIOP, they have excellent programs where you can network with a variety of disciplines and make connections uh, as an appraiser to tap into different areas of expertise. Uh, to, you know, going back to that question of who can we network with? Yeah. Same with the ICSC, the shopping center folks. They're good uh, good resources for how to figure out what to do with retail properties. Right. You know, at a, at a retail level, your local real estate appraiser, uh, when he or she is 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 good, is is an invaluable resource for how to finance a project, who's financing projects, what the financial metrics are, not only at the at the point where you need an appraiser to write an appraisal report, but also at the front end to help you structure the feasibility of these projects. Um, appraisers have a, a, a head and a file cabinet full of the kind of metrics at a very local granular level um, on how projects can and will get financed. Uh, and they can be a terrific resource at the conference table, at, at the the meeting um, at the front end of these things and, and ought to be relied on and ought to be brought in in a consulting fashion. And so appraisers ought to be marketing themselves that way. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I, I certainly appreciate that, that final thought, John. I would like to say thanks to our panel today for helping to share their insights on adaptive reuse and conversion. Uh, just the tip of the iceberg, and uh, but we do appreciate your time and expertise, and we encourage everyone who's interested in exploring that further with you all directly or uh, with your related organizations and suggestions. And for yeah. our audience, we appreciate your time, and we will see you again next week at AI Answers. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, Thanks Bill.